to start off on economic growth and the topic of, of inequality. One of the presidential candidates is telling us that, that the national economy is a huge disaster. Um, some of the data uh, over the past eight years, more than 15 million private sector jobs were created since growth turned positive in 2010. Unemployment is down from a peak of 10% to under 5%. And the federal deficit is down from 10% of GDP, a trillion four, almost cut in half, more than cut in half, to about 3% now. But there is a lot of data, you've written a lot about it, about rising inequality, and that's clearly fueling the concern about those left behind, and therefore what we're seeing, the substantial dysfunction and political polarization. And you've been really articulate in your writing about the list of things that are driving rising inequality, whether it's education, immigration, tax reform, infra infrastructure spend, work policies, technology. So what I'm hoping we can start off with is, in that long list, what are the couple of policies that you should think should be at the top of the list because they both will have a big impact and can get through Congress? So ability to get done and impact. Great, well, thanks so much for having me here. Thanks for counting the number of days I have left. That's not <laughs> something I've done before. I read my children the description of this event, and when they heard about the storytellers, they thought they should be here and I should be home working. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll see what we can do about that. Um, I first of all want to associate myself with Eric's real optimism about the global economy and about the US economy. We're just living in an amazing time. We're seeing transformation. A lot of things really are improving. But I think at the same time, my job and the president's job, more importantly, is to look at where we can make things better and look at where the challenges are and where the problems are. And so to some degree in our conversation, we may dwell on that. And one of those problems is the incomes that middle class families have. They are going up. I think some of the ideas that they're going down is nonsense. And in fact, last year they went up at the fastest rate they ever have on record. But if you look at the last 20, 30 years, they're going up a lot more slowly than they were going up in the decades before that. And I think that should be a real worry for us and something we should ask what to do about. And the two classes of answers to that are things that make the pie grow faster, that increase our productivity growth, and the things that make sure that we can share the pie better, addressing inequality. And the most exciting thing is when you find things that do both. So education is in the category that expands the pie and improves um, your slice of the pie. Something like the minimum wage is a little bit more about how the pie is divided, but I think that's important when it's gotten tilted increasingly um, in one direction. But I do think you know, at the end of the day, if we can make growth faster, whether it's investing in infrastructure, education, research, reforming our business tax system, expanding international trade, that's you know, absolutely a necessary condition. And to the here. second part of my question, important list, but which realistically can get through the next Congress, whoever wins, which would you put at the top? And you know, I, in my experience, people trying to forecast what Congress can do are about as good at that as I am at forecasting what's going to happen to growth in the next quarter. And so I think part of the job of the government is to, of the president, is to put forward the very best ideas, try their hardest to get them done. And you're never quite sure. Sometimes Congress actually surprises you and does something um, you wouldn't expect them to. Um, I would be lying if I didn't say they um, more than occasionally disappoint in taking something you'd think is screamingly obvious for the country and somehow managing not uh, to do it. I think in December, there's an opportunity to pass the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's something the president negotiated with partners around the, both sides of um, the Pacific, representing 40% of the global economy. I think that's really important to our economic future and our national security. I then think next year, immigration is the number one thing that we could do for our economic growth, our economy, and our society. I want to come back to immigration, but uh, talk a bit about labor force participation, because you've obviously done a lot of work there. And I think it was quite intriguing when I was uh, first reading it that there's been a larger decline in the US in prime age male labor force participation versus other advanced countries. So we're now the third lowest uh, amongst the OECD, and it's not because of the rising participation of women. In fact, fewer than 25% of unemployed men are married to a working woman. And you've really stressed this decline um, is due to bad policy choices uh, and it has a substantial impact on long-term growth. And I thought notable that you talk a lot about high incarceration rates as well as skills training. So can you just talk a bit about this male participation rate, why you focus on that as such a leading indicator for long-term growth 
and what should we be doing there? Yeah, no, I'm glad you're asking this. This is something we've done a lot of work on at the Council of Economic Advisors. And people are very familiar with inequality. Inequality is this person's income is growing faster than this person's income and they're spreading apart. There's something even worse, which is people who not only can't find a job, but have given up looking for a job and they're no longer in the workforce. In the 1950s, only 2% of men between the age of 25 and 54 were out of the workforce. Now it's 12%, and as you said, that's worse than almost any of the other OECD economies. And this problem's been building for decades. And when you think of opioid addiction, the rise of suicide, some of the, I know we're not supposed to say the word populism, Dan, my apologies, some of the populism we see in our country, there's something about being really excluded from our economy that's particularly bad. You look at these men, they're primarily without a high school, uh, with a high school education or less. They're primarily not married. Um, it's not entirely clear where their income is coming from because most of them aren't on disability insurance. I think part of it is that the demand for unskilled labor has fallen. That leads to greater inequality and lower wages and less employment, but also mass incarceration. We have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners, and incarcerate a larger fraction of our population than any large country in the world. So I think that's also progressively taken its toll on men's ability to participate in our economy. And bending the curve on that, whether that's through dealing with the incarceration trends or, and or job training, what does that do for long-term growth? Um, I think that's really important because one of the big challenges that the United States has and all the advanced economies have right now is demography. We have an older population. People are starting to retire. That's perfectly great if people have earned their retirement and they want to retire at an older age, but it's really creating challenges for our growth and other broader macroeconomic challenges for macroeconomic management. You know, one way to solve that is to make more people in those countries that actually are trying to encourage higher birth rates. One is through more immigration. I certainly think we should be doing that here. But one is taking the people who are already here and giving them the tools to enable them to work and participate in our economy. Now I want to shift to um, GDP. Is it a useful metric or not? And many believe, including Google's economist, Hal Varian, that given how rapidly the economies transform, GDP is no longer a relevant measure. It was a 50s measure, and we've moved beyond that. And yet, many times, policies anchor back to what is GDP growth. So can you talk about your view of uh, GDP as a measure? Should it be changing? How much yeah. do you rely on it? Sure. So I think there's two different questions here. One is you're trying to, at a high frequency, figure out what's going on in the economy. Did the economy do well or badly in Q2? And there's two general sets of options. One is to look at data on the labor market, what happened to the unemployment and job creation. The other is to look at what happened to GDP. I would place 80, 85% of the weight in assessing the economy on the job market for any given quarter. It's, there's issues measurement there, but it's not that hard conceptually to add up all the people that are working, figure out what the unemployment rate is. GDP is really difficult to measure. It's really difficult to count all the little bits of the economy. And then the hardest thing, the thing that Hal Varian has talked about, is figuring out what a quality adjustment is. Something may cost more, but it does a lot more for you. So your GDP actually um, went up, and you need to figure out what's a quality improvement versus what is a price increase. So for, at a high frequency, trying to figure out the economy, look at jobs. Over longer periods of time, I think we're missing a lot in GDP, a lot of the digital stuff that everyone in this room is so excited about. We do a poor job measuring that and possibly even an increasingly poor job measuring it. So I think, and I think most economists think the growth rate is probably higher today than what it was. I think it is the case, though, that GDP does tell us something. I think we've, GDP's always been higher than we thought. Maybe we're mismeasuring a little bit more now, but even when you take into account mismeasurement, I think it's still the case, unfortunately, that productivity growth is slower today than what it had been in the past and that we should be able to do a lot better. And part of that is that tech, as exciting as it is, is still only a small part of the economy. Most of what we do is hospitals, education, you know, housing construction, things like that. We don't see the same type of productivity growth that we've seen in you, know, you see in your neighborhood in California. And when you said that it, it would, if we were properly measuring and capturing this, it would um, suggest higher GDP growth than what we're actually stating. What's the magnitude? I don't want to be pinned down on a magnitude, and having said that, we'll then 
<laughs> venture some reckless number. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the growth rate was, the true growth rate was you know, about a percentage point higher than we think it is, but it could be wildly different from right. that. And as I said, I think that's also true in the past. And this is a view, you know, Hal Varian has it, uh, Marty Feldstein, who had my job in the Reagan administration, has said the same thing. So this isn't, a, uh, I don't think this is a controversial view. The bigger question is, are we measuring it much worse today than in the past? And the answer to that is yes. I, I think maybe exactly. a little bit worse, but not much worse. Okay. Um, and again, it's, it's, our statisticians are great at what they do. It's just they've been handed an impossible task. So in terms of job creation, one uh, area that seems so prime and appropriate given the facts today is more infrastructure spend. We've got a low interest rate environment, crumbling infrastructure, and of course the opportunity to create jobs. I was always struck by Ben Bernanke's comment when he was chairman of the Fed that monetary policy can only do so much. It bought us time, but implored Congress to do its part with fiscal policy. Uh, so uh, clearly you, you were in the early days um, did a great job pushing through the Recovery Act in the early days of the Obama administration. You've credited that with keeping the U.S. out of something that could have been more like the Great Depression. But what was learned from the efforts with the Recovery Act in, in the early days of the Obama administration in terms of successes, things that weren't done as well as we're going into the next administration? If you could design what that program would look like, whether it's size or focus, how would you redirect where we spend? So I think in terms of the economics, the economics are quite straightforward. Infrastructure can help with more demand that helps lower the unemployment rate and also helps put some of those, uh, you know, we were talking about labor force participation before, it helps address an issue like that, putting people back to work. But perhaps even more important is supply, what it can do to our productive capacity. You know, we're doing a great job in you know, businesses making all sorts of innovative investments uh, the government is doing a lot less um, than it should. So I think the economics here is quite straightforward and is strengthened in a world where global interest rates are a lot lower, as you said. That both makes it cheaper for us to invest in infrastructure, but also means we can take some of the pressure off monetary policymakers if we do more of our job. So I don't think I learned a lot economically. I think what I learned, though, was politically, which was in early 2009, Congress was incredibly focused on the urgent problem we had we passed something that was larger than any single measure that was passed in the Great Depression relative to the size of the economy. Turned out our economic problems were even worse than what we had realized. We were talking about GDP before. The GDP number we were looking at when we did the Recovery Act was minus four for the um, fourth quarter of 2008. They ended up revising it to minus eight. So the economy was in much worse shape. Well, what do you do if you're sick and you're in much worse shape? you double down on, on what it is. Maybe you take some extra medicine, maybe you take it for a little bit longer. And Congress lost its attention a lot faster than I would have thought, um, than what I would have expected. It moved on, it didn't want to do um, other big things in the same way. We still managed to eke a number of things out, but doing more things that are over multiple years, that happen automatically in a recession, that build in maybe a funding mechanism to help pay for them and make them sustainable, as the president's proposed, with a fee on, on oil. I think all of that helps solve what I think is more of a political puzzle about how do you get more infrastructure than an economic one, where the economics are about as straightforward as anything I work on. There's also, though, been uh, quite a bit of focus from the private sector on public-private partnerships for infrastructure spend. The notion, where else can you get a decent return in this low-rate environment? What more can be done to get private sector money to get some of these pro these often talked about but rarely executed public-private partnerships and infrastructure right. moving forward? Right. So first of all, I think in a lot of sectors, the first choice actually is the government. Mm -hmm. We can borrow much more cheaply do things at scale and, and do things that have large public benefits. And that's certainly true for highways and transit, for example. I think there's a number of sectors where you can really capture the return. Airports, ports, freight rail that I think the private sector does um, and should play a bigger role. I think insofar as we can't convince Congress to invest as much in infrastructure as it should, then you know, public-private partnerships may be your second choice, but they still might be worth doing. We've put a lot of thought into that because the United States has been less good at them than many other countries around the world. We've attracted less capital than others. Some of that is some tax laws we have, something um, with the obscure name of FERPTA that we were able to repeal at the end of last year. And I've heard 
from investors in other countries, that that would make it more attractive to invest in the United States. Some of it is that every state and locality has a different set of rules, and some of those rules are sensible, but often they're not. And so we've been trying to do what we can to work with states to streamline um, some of those. But I certainly think um, that there's a lot to be gained from private capital in the sector. And then at the outset, you talked about the importance of immigration. And I'm certainly, as somebody who was not born in this country, a big believer that um, there's quite a bit of good that comes from, from immigration. Over 40% of the Fortune 500 companies were founded by first or second generation um, immigrants, including our company. And there's a lot of data that suggests for every H-1B that, um, that we, we grant, there are five more jobs that are created. So a, a great multiplier effect, and yet it keeps stalling out. So what can the people in this room and corporate leaders more generally be doing to be helpful to get it across the finish line? It seems like it's close, but doesn't get over. Yeah. So um, first of all, I don't think anyone in this room needs convincing on the economics that you know, it deals with the labor force issues we were talking about before, but it also brings in talented people, which add to our productivity. And then this part we shouldn't forget either. You know, we always talk about how uncertainty is bad for businesses. Right. Imagine the 11 million people in our country right now who aren't authorized to work in the United States, the type of uncertainty they face. You give them a path forward and they can move to a better job, they can move to a better neighborhood, they can start a business, they can invest more in school. That would be really good for our productivity and economy too. I think the right path forward here economically and the path that's gonna work politically is to keep those two issues joined both the issues more associated at the high-tech end of the spectrum and the issues of these 11 million people who you know, both are important to our economy but also um, you know, are just facing a terrible situation and moving forward together in a common sense way that improves our border security, that gives a path for the people here and that fixes our, the way we admit people going forward. For example, you, know, you get a, a higher, uh, higher degree in STEM staple a green card to that. We'd love to have you Absolutely. contribute to our economy. And you know, I'd love to see that as something that happens. And what more do you think we can collectively be doing or should we be doing? I mean, the people in this room are doing a lot. The one thing I would say is hang in there and make sure these two issues stay together because if you try to pick off and just handle one of them, it really isn't going to work. It really isn't going to pass. We have to not divide on this issue, stay together, work on the enforcement piece, the high tech piece, and the people that are here, um, all three of those is, is really the way to move forward. I'm gonna ask one more question if people wanna start lining up to the mics, we'll have time for a couple of questions. Um, before we came in, we were talking about your recent piece on um, AI and the impact on jobs and the economy and, and as a force for good. Can you just give us a sense of how you're looking at it now? Sure. So I'm not one of the people who is afraid that the robots are gonna take all our jobs and I think any economic policy based on the premise that anything's gonna take all of our jobs is badly mistaken. And the evidence I have for that is 2,000 years of technological progress. The things that people did 2,000 years ago can all be done by machines, and yet 95% you know, of the people who want a job have one. So I'm pretty confident about that. I am a bit worried, though, and I'm worried that part of why robots won't take all our jobs is that they'll underbid some of us. And I think they'll underbid more low-skilled people than high-skilled people, and that'll contribute to downward pressure on wages and inequality. So I'm worried that they'll contribute to that. And I'm worried also that we talked about this trend of a lower fraction of the population le um, not working. I don't think it's that the robots take your job and there's not a new job. I think there is a new job. You just may not know how to find it or get it. So I think robots in some ways will just be a continuation of that inequality and labor force participation challenge we've seen over the last few decades. They don't require some outlandish new idea like a universal basic income so that people don't need to work, but they do require us to up our game on education, on training, on helping people get into jobs so that we can take advantage of it rather than um, have the, the slightly worse scenario. I yeah, you're very that. consistent with where we are, which is the, the it's, you can't stop technological change and advancement, and it's incumbent on all of us, private and public sector, to ensure that we're investing in job training and skills so that we can position people for whatever that new world is. So I yep. agree with that. I think we have one question over here. Um, hello, my name's Chip Wilson. I um, come from West Beach Snowboard, Lou Lemon, and now Kit Nace. Um, I'm an American living in Canada, and I look at um, 
the, the, I'm going to take a wild guess. There's $200 billion a year that the Americans are no longer sending to Middle East on, for oil. What is that number could be? You know far better than I do. But it strikes me over the next 20 years, that's a massive amount of money that's staying in the United States. And nobody really seems to talk about it. And I think it's going to be the number one um, driver of the American economy. Um, I'd like to know what you think about that. Yeah, I think that's, you're, you're actually about right with the number. And it's a really important point. And it's important also to understand how we got there. We got there because we're producing more oil in the United States, about three and a half million barrels per day, more than was expected. That's the equivalent of almost discovering a new Iraq here in the United States. It's that much oil. At the same time, we actually are consuming less oil than we consumed a decade ago, even though our economy is much larger than it was a decade ago, and our fuel economy standards for cars and, and other measures have contributed to that. And that oil consumption surprise, um, we're consuming, I think, about six or seven million barrels per day less than what we would have thought. So we're a 10 million barrel per day smaller drain on the global oil supply. That helped contribute to the lower prices. And so we're both buying less from abroad. We're, most, we're making far more of it here than we import from abroad. And we're paying less for it. And that combination is really good news for our economy. It means we're much less vulnerable to oil shocks than we used to be. Certainly when the price of oil goes up, that's bad for the economy. When it goes down, it's good for the economy. But it's a much smaller good on the down than it used to be and a much smaller bad on the up than it's used to be, and, and I'd rather be in that position that's hedged than taking a, a large bet on oil prices. I think oil prices are part of why consumers had the fastest income growth last year that they've ever had on record. They're part of what has enabled you know, some industries that rely on oil as an input to do better. Um, the low price of oil has, of course, created a challenge for oil exporting businesses, and that's part of what it means to be hedged. I don't think there's a particular policy. I don't think, you know, we're not going to tell people what to do with the oil windfall. That's something consumers and businesses need to figure out. What we need to do as policymakers is those policies around fuel efficiency, around, you know, safe and reliable production that put us in the position to get that windfall or an even bigger one in the future. I'm sorry, I don't think I was clear. It's more like 200 billion a year coming into the U.S. economy a year over quite a few years. Like, that's a major shock to the economy, and I think that you, you told me everything I think I know, but it's more like what, what oh. is going to happen. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that money is in the pockets of consumers, and it's in the pockets of you know, oil-consuming businesses, and they're going to figure out what to do with it. You see really high levels of consumer spending growth right now, which is great. People are spending some of that windfall. So I don't think it's my job to decide what to do with that. It's a positive for the economy, although a smaller positive than you'd think, because it hurts the oil producing industry in the United States at the same time that it helps oil consumers. I think our job is to make sure we get you know, more of that positive situation rather than deciding or predicting what we'll do with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Question over here. My name is uh, Chris Friedland. I'm uh, from Build.com, founder and president. I uh, you mentioned the universal basic income as an outlandish idea, and you referenced the last 2,000 years of innovation and how jobs have evolved. But I think I would attest to, and many would attest to the room, that the rate of innovation is starting to grow exponentially. There's a great video on YouTube called Humans Need Not Apply, which documents as transportation becomes irrelevant and some of these other manual jobs, which is happening at a rate uh, the innovations happen in those categories at a rate faster than it ever has, these jobs are going to be eliminated very, very quickly. So I'd like to learn more about why you think the universal basic income is an outlandish idea. Right. So, uh, and maybe the adjective was a little bit um, uh, over-torqued, but I think the basic point is one I would stand by. If you look at, you know, there are newspaper articles going back 100 years predicting that the next innovation is going to cause mass unemployment and put people out of jobs. There's, you know, you sort of headline after headline that looks a, lo a lot like the headline you say today. And yet each wave of innovation has created a new set of jobs as well. 
Also, it makes people richer. And when people are richer, they want to buy more, and that also creates more jobs. And those two have roughly balanced out for thousands of years, for the last 200 years, at times of massive technological transformation. So I am, you know, maybe 200, 300 years from now, we're in some far futuristic world none of us can imagine, and which point we can have the robots design a universal basic income system to support the rest of us. But at any time in the next 20, 30, the horizon that I'm operating on for thinking about public policy, I think the same laws that have operated in the economy for the last couple hundred years apply. You know, the exponential growth, um, I mean, this gets back to what, you know, Ruth and I were discussing, you know, measured productivity growth is lower now than it was before. I think there may be some problems in those numbers, but I think they're more right than they are wrong. So I actually think we need more innovation and faster productivity growth. The last thing I'd say is just, I would love the premise to be people can work, people find work really fulfilling. My suspicion is there's a lot of people in this room that don't need to work as hard as they do, but love what they do. That's something that I certainly am in that category. Um, that's something that more people um, should do and more people should have the opportunity to do. So I think that's our responsibility, not figuring out um, something premised on the idea that the jobs are disappearing. So on that very positive note on the importance of even more innovation and thanks to all the people in the room who are driving that innovation, Jason, thank you for being here and thank you for your service to the country. Thank, thank you, you so much.